We're here in Bolsa Chica, which is one of the last best salt marshes left in Southern California. There are more than 300 types of birds that live here, and they all face various threats. From oil spills, to development, to runoff, they face everything that human beings are throwing at them. When it comes to environmental health, birds are on the front line. In the North Atlantic, seabirds are vanishing from places where they had always been plentiful. Alaska's tiny chickadees and Georgia's coots are suffering mysterious defects and diseases. Ospreys and vultures, wrens and terns are all contaminated with industrial chemicals, mercury, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and ingredients from consumer products. Robins are dropping dead from an old chemical ban nearly a half century ago. Bald eagles are killed by lead shot left behind by hunters. Owls are dying excruciating deaths from rat poisons. Still others are trying to cope with the altered oceans and the warming planet. Here I am on the shores of Lake Ontario, just down the street from where I live in Toronto. So this is one of the Great Lakes, which, is one of the, which was the great laboratory for experiments um, during the 1970s and 80s and 90s on how pesticides were affecting birds. I thought that the problems of pesticides and the problems of chemicals and birds were finished with. I thought that it ended with DDT and then some of the later pesticides, and it turns out that that may not be the case. So I started looking at a class of pesticides called neonicotinoids. And this is the newest class of pesticides. They're the, most, they're the most widely used now in the world. And I looked at what scientists are finding out about how they affect birds. I went to Delorier Island, just north of Montreal on the St. Lawrence River, where scientists are investigating a colony of about 90,000 ring-billed galls that have extremely high levels of flame retardant chemicals in them. It's a crazy place because there's basically this huge colony of birds covering the island and it's you can hear it uh, when you're traveling up the St. Lawrence River in the boat you can hear the squawking and the screaming. I also went to the Sleeping Bear Sand Dunes National Lakeshore in the northwest part of Michigan's Lower Peninsula where, where scientists are trying to understand why there's been a, a surge in avian botulism outbreaks over the past decade. They're trying to get a handle on where the, the outbreaks might be occurring, what are the right conditions for them, and, and ultimately trying to predict where these botulism outbreaks will happen so they can prevent them in the future. I wrote a story that traced the journey of one bald eagle that was suffering from lead poisoning. Big game hunters, unlike duck hunters, still use lead core bullets. Now hunters don't want to pack out the whole animal, so they often will uh, field dress the deer, leaving piles of guts behind. And bald eagles are more than happy to scavenge off those, those gut piles. In fact, I'm told that they will eat and eat until they're too fat to fly. No one knows how many of these bald eagles die in the backcountry, but a few cases every year end up at raptor centers, like the Teton Raptor Center. And what I found remarkable was the incredible effort that the staff puts in to try to return these birds to the wild, give them a second chance. Today I'm in Flate Island, which is a very important breeding site for many uh, seabirds, such as guillemots, kittiwakes, arctic terns, and puffins. But something's wrong. Normally, ornithologists say you should see thousands of puffins breeding uh, in the colony below me. In fact, it's called Lundeberg or Puffin Cliff. But now you can only see a few dozen swimming on the bay over there, and it looks like the burrows are all empty. And this has been going on for several years now. Normally, the skies would be full of Arctic terns. And again, this year, as in the past few years, there have only been uh, in the dozens. Sooty shearwaters are graceful sea dancers, skimming just above the ocean surface and dipping a wingtip in to kick up spray. I've seen them fly from the southern tip of Argentina to Monterey Bay off California's coast. 
but their remarkable journey also gives Sooties an important story to tell about the health of our oceans, and it's essential that we listen to what they have to say. These warnings that birds are sending us can be heard in your own backyard as well. Listen to the songbirds. You'll find, if you listen closely, that their songs are changing too. Canary in the coal mine isn't just a proverb anymore. Birds around the world are telling us what ails in their environment and possibly what ails us as well. For the last 40 years or so, or 30 years or so, uh, scientists have realized that osprey can really be a sentinel species. And what that means basically is they can tell us a great deal about what's going on in the environment. Since osprey sit at the top of the food chain and they bioaccumulate contaminants, uh, because they eat fish, which have eaten other fish, which have eaten still other fish, which have eaten insect, uh, they accumulate all of the toxins and they can tell us a great deal, therefore, about what is in the very local area from which they hunt. They are the ultimate locavores eating right from the, from the rivers and, and lakes around which they have their nests or their perches. On a recent trip to Alaska, I came across birds that are sending a warning signal, a signal too subtle for us yet to figure out. Chickadees are turning up with deformed beaks. They look like twisted macaroni. The, the scientists can't figure out why this is going on. There have been no contaminants, no evidence of disease. Another story examines the growing effects of urban lights at night. This isn't about birds flying into towers. This is about the effects on the hormonal system of birds. The research is still early, but attention is growing on what is called loss of night. For winged warnings, I wrote about loons. Loons are really a, a great conservation story, uh, but in the last couple of years, scientists that study loons have started noticing that um, in a lot of places, they are not replacing themselves at sustainable levels. So researchers are looking at you know, why that might be and starting to find that factors like contaminants and uh, climate change might be playing a role. Uh, one interesting thing I learned uh, writing about lead poisoning and birds was that uh, we tend to think of animals as sentinels for human health, but humans can serve as sentinels for animals too. Um, a lot of what is known about um, the effects of lead poisoning in birds and uh, treating it actually comes from studies and observations uh, made in humans. Within about the last 15 to 20 years, scientists uh, started noticing um, this strange neurological disease at, in waterfowl and uh, eagles at some southern lakes. Um, uh, they were disoriented and uncoordinated and having trouble doing things like swimming and flying. Um, and when they looked at the brains of the dead birds, they saw um, lesions or holes. Um, and, and Nobody, knew, nobody really knows what, what is causing the disease, but I uh, spent some time with researchers at the University of Georgia who are getting closer to figuring out a cause and what warnings it may hold for human health. Around the world, more than 1,300 bird species are threatened. That's one in every eight birds. Winged Warnings reveals what's new and surprising about these global threats to birds, and it also reveals what these birds might be telling us about our own health.